Okay, anatomy students, this video is set up so that you can learn a little bit about the structure of the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, and the stomach. So we'll try to get through as much anatomy and a little bit of physiology along the way about what happens to food once it enters your mouth and makes its way to the stomach. So we're starting with this particular view that you have in front of you right now. And this view is a sagittal section of the head of the cephalic region. So basically, it splits the skull at the nose section, and you're looking at it from a lateral view. So this is the sinus of your frontal bone that we've discussed before. This is your vertebrae, and these blue pieces that you see in between are the intervertebral discs that we've also discussed. Um, your spinal cord would be right here, and I'm coloring in green. And so the area that we're focused on is this section right here. We want to know how food is affected as it enters this area. This area is called the oral cavity, and we're going to begin today by looking at um, the different structures within the oral cavity. So just to orient ourselves, let's make sure we understand where everything is specifically at. So this area from where your teeth are, which are right here, over here to this section on the back side of the mouth, um, these, this is called your oral cavity. And the oral cavity is, is has on its floor level the tongue, which I put a green dot on. And the tongue is actually a pretty big structure. On the superior surface, we have the hard palate, which I have a red dot on. If you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and slide it around, you'll feel that very rigid area. That is the hard palate. And that particular bone that we studied in the skeletal unit called the palatine process and the horizontal plate make up the hard palate. If you follow your tongue backward toward what you would consider to be your throat, um, you would actually end up reaching a softer area identified by this green dot. And this is the soft palate. There isn't any bone above the soft palate. Many of um, the odors that are associated with your food, smells, um, actually enter the nasal cavity from this area. So when we talk about the fact that you can't, um, if you plug your nose, you can't taste your food, a lot of that has to do with um, the smells going through your soft palate into your nasal cavity. As we pre proceed more towards the posterior, the soft palate eventually becomes a structure called the uvula. And the uvula does have a specific job. And we'll look at that here in a moment when we discuss the process of swallowing. As we move further, looking at um, a piece of food possibly that has entered the mouth, the teeth and tongue will move the food around. The teeth will grind and cut it into smaller pieces. The tongue will move it around, and eventually the tongue will help you swallow um, this material. Once the food has entered the mouth and has mixed with saliva, it's now going to be referred to as bolus. So the tongue will help push the bolus to the back of the, what's called the pharynx. And the pharynx is a common air food tube that's found right here. So the pharynx actually is this dot that I've um, noted in black. But I'm going to draw an arrow here so that you understand exactly where that's at. So the pharynx is here. It's this entire area. And even above a little bit and below it is still the pharynx. So this is still pharynx here, and this is still pharynx here. On the superior side, this part of the pharynx is called the nasopharynx, and is a direct cavity between the nose and the mouth. Where the dot is, that's the oral um, cavity area, so that's the oral pharynx. And then lastly, on the inferior aspect, we have what's called the laryngopharynx. So each one of these are just specific areas of the pharynx, but the pharynx in general is a common tube for both food and air. As the pharynx ends, the tube divides into two different structures. One tube which will carry your food, known as the esophagus, and one tube that will carry your air, and that is called your trachea. I have a blue dot on the trachea, and I have a purple dot on the esophagus. So here is the esophagus, and the blue dot is on the trachea. So that's the trachea. Now, in order to make sure that the bolus enters the right tube, we have a structure called the epiglottis. And I have a purple dot on the epiglottis. And let me draw an arrow to that so that you can see it just a bit better. 
So there's the epiglottis. When you swallow the bolus, the epiglottis will actually take the time to come up over the trachea, the opening to the trachea, and it will prevent any food from entering the trachea, from entering the trachea, which would then enter your lungs. And food will then slide in the esophagus. You can see that the esophagus is very narrow. It's actually a collapsed tube. But once the bolus enters the esophagus, muscles of the esophagus take over. They squeeze around the bolus, pushing it toward the stomach. Now the last structure that I wanted to show you is the opening to the eustachian tube. Um, and that's here. There's a tiny black dot I have back here showing that. That opening to your eustachian tube is actually an opening into your ear canal. And so there is actually a full connection between your nose, ears, and throat. And that's probably why we have doctors which are called ear, nose, and throat specialists. So if you ever have drops put in your ear, sometimes you can actually end up tasting them because the drops will go into your ear, make their way into your nasal cavity, and eventually into your oral cavity, and you can actually um, taste them. In addition, you might notice that once in a while when you're sick, your ears really itch. Well, there is a tonsil back here as well called the palatine tonsil, and that sometimes will swell when you're ill and push against the opening to the eustachian tube, causing you to um, uh, feel that kind of swelling and cause your inner ear to itch. So now we want to look at the process of swallowing. The process of swallowing is actually consists of two different phases. The first phase, known as the oral phase, is actually a voluntary phase. The second phase, known as the esophageal-pharyngeal phase, is actually an involuntary phase. So it begins once the food has been mashed and compacted into bolus, the tongue will lift the bolus towards the pharynx. So you will lift up your tongue and push the bolus towards the back of your mouth and it will enter the pharynx area. This is the oral phase. It's completely voluntary. But once the bolus reaches the pharynx, then the involuntary phase takes over. At this point, the tongue will remain in its location in order to block the movement. So the tongue lifts up like this, blocking the area of the mouth so that the bolus won't leave. And then the soft palate actually lifts in this direction and blocks the nasal cavity so that the bolus won't come out of your nose. And the epiglottis will fold up and cover the trachea so that the bolus won't enter the trachea. At this point, all three openings where the bolus could go are closed, except for the fourth opening, which is the esophagus, and the bolus will then enter the esophagus. As mentioned, the pharyngeal esophageal phase is not voluntary, that's an involuntary phase. Once the bolus has reached the esophagus, muscles of the esophagus will take over, squeeze around the bolus, and force it into the stomach. This is a video of someone swallowing, and they're actually swallowing a substance called barium, which is why you can see it in an x-ray. So if we take a look at this, we can watch that process of swallowing in, in great detail here. So the person is taking in that barium, they're lifting their tongue, so watch the voluntary phase, watch how they lift their tongue, and watch how once the barium reaches the oral pharynx, that the process is very fluid, and there's really no control over it at that point. Watch how the soft palate and uvula lift to block the nose. You can see that right in here. Here's the soft palate. Watch it. And also watch the epiglottis right here, how it folds over the top of the trachea. So the, the epiglottis is right in here. Also notice how close the esophagus is until the bolus, in this case it's barium, the barium bolus reaches the esophagus and then it expands. But once the barium is in the esophagus, the muscles squeeze right behind it. Notice how they pinch and push it towards the stomach. So let's take a look at the structure of the stomach. Like all other areas of the alimentary canal, the stomach consists of four major layers. The outside layer of the stomach is called the serosa, which is shown in this layer right here. It's probably best shown by that line. Then we have the muscularis layer. Well, the stomach has three layers of muscle. Not all areas of the alimentary canal have three layers, but this one does. And then we have the submucosa, which is that vascular layer that we talked about that helps provide blood flow to the mucosa. 
And then the most inner lining is called the mucosa, which is shown here. This inner lining right here, I can draw a line on that so you can see it a little bit better. But that would be this inner lining right here. And remember, the submucosa, I'll draw in red, is this lining that's filled with blood vessels that kind of nourishes um, the mucosa. Now the muscularis actually consists of three different layers. Let me put a dot on each one of those. Here's a purple dot, and that purple dot is on what we call the longitudinal layer. Identified because the fibers of the smooth muscle actually run up and down in a longitudinal manner. Interior to that, or deep to the longitudinal layer, then we have the circular layer. So here's a green dot on the circular layer. Notice that these fibers run around the stomach so that when this layer contracts, it actually pinches the stomach, squeezes it together. And then finally, we have the oblique layer. And oblique, by definition, refers to the layer that um, is, its fibers run at an angle. So these oblique layer fibers run at an angle. Now I have the same line pointing out the muscularis as is the oblique layer. So that red dot is on the oblique layer. All three layers, longitudinal, circular, and oblique, are all the muscularis. So the muscularis is basically all three of these layers. Now if we look at other structures within the stomach that help us understand what the stomach looks like, we can identify certain features of the stomach. So the upper portion of the stomach right here is called the cardia. So the cardia region is up here close to where the heart would be. This area in this section is called the fundus. As we move into the body of the stomach, this area that starts to kind of narrow is called the pyloric antrum. But once it really starts to narrow, it's referred to as the pyloric canal. So this area, let me outline that so it's easier to see. So this area in this general section right here is the pyloric canal, whereas this area is really the pyloric antrum. On the superior side of the stomach, we have a structure known as the esophagus. And when we left talking about the pharynx and the esophagus, we noted that the bolus would enter the esophagus after swallowing and then reach the stomach. So this is the point at which the esophagus reaches the stomach. As bolus ends in the esophagus and reaches the stomach, there's a muscular ring of tissue around the outside of the esophagus that will pinch and close, and it opens and closes um, as, a, as a circular structure to make sure that the material in the stomach doesn't move up into the esophagus as the stomach is contracting to digest the bolus. This structure is called the cardiac sphincter, and sometimes is also referred to as the lower esophageal sphincter. So I'm going to place a purple mark on that so that you can see where it is. You can see it's a thicker region of muscle and basically this closes so that as the stomach is breaking up mechanically and chemically digesting the bolus that none of the food will go back up into the esophagus. Now this isn't perfect. There are people where that cardiac sphincter will open and if it does open in an individual they will have uh, what is known as heartburn or acid reflux. On the posing end of the stomach, after the bolus has been chemically and mechanically digested, it's propelled down into the pyloric canal. And like a funnel, as the stomach is churning and, and mixing materials around, um, this is kind of the last place that material um, ends up. And so the duodenum is the next location that it will go to, and that's the first portion of the small intestine, which this line is pointing out. Closing the duodenum from the pyloric canal and the rest of the stomach is the pyloric sphincter, and that keeps the stomach contents from the duodenum and only allows a small amount to enter at the time. It's the same type of structure as the lower esophageal or cardiac sphincter. There are also uh, ridges inside the stomach known as rugae, and these help grind up food. Lastly, the outside curvature of the stomach is the greater curvature, and the inside curvature 
is known as the lesser curvature.